Okay. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for this idea scale webinar. Um, I'm here today with Steve Rader, who is a program manager at NASA Tournament Lab and the Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation. Uh, Steve is from NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. So he's joining us from Texas today, which is awesome. We have a West Coast on the line. Uh, I'm here in Washington, DC with the government team at IdeaScale, and I'm really excited to get things started. So first, I'm going to do a brief overview of IdeaScale, and then I'll pass things off to Steve. So we are the only FedRAMP certified innovation management platform. We are government industry leaders, and we've been helping organizations transform their cultures for almost 15 years now. Uh, we've worked with everyone from the White House to Department of Defense to state and local governments. And that is just a bit about IdeaScale. We'll keep it very brief. The spotlight's on Steve today. Um, and I will pass things over now. Uh, okay. Let's see. See my screen? I think you can now. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Lizzie. Uh, this is uh, Idea Scale, someone we've worked with for a long time, and it's uh, always great to, to talk to your community because uh, we kind of feel like we're part of that. So uh, I will dive in here on our presentation. Uh, just a little context. Uh, our Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation at NASA uh, actually works across all of NASA and across the entire federal government to kind of help projects and organizations learn about what innovation is. And so today I'll actually kind of give you the same roadshow that I give our employees, um, which for some of you will be redundant. You, you, you know some of this stuff, but uh, hopefully you'll learn kind of how we talk about it. Uh, and, and hopefully that will be useful to some of you. Um, as you might know, NASA has a lot of problems to go solve. Uh, there's a reason we don't all live on other planets and just go around at light speed, right? Uh, we have hard problems to go attack. Uh, and these are kind of a list of some of our major problems that we have to improve before people can go uh, out into the solar system as a more regular basis. Um, and so that's kind of the basis of where we start from is we are about solving really hard problems. Um, but I like to contextualize this as the why. Why is crowdsourcing important? Why is, is open innovation one of these tools? And the, the biggest driver is something that you all know, and you all know this because it hits you every single day, and that is that the world has changed. Um, it hasn't changed a little bit. It has changed a lot. And what we're starting to see now is that, that methods and approaches for engineering and for technology that have worked for us for, you know, a hundred years are starting to kind of crumble and break and become brittle. And so part of that is actually starting with, with population. Um, I don't know if you're kind of familiar with the curve for population, but if you start at, you know, 1 AD, uh, the first doubling of the population wasn't until the year 1400 <laughs> and, and in that century. And if you look and more recently, we're at a very different part of that curve. And within just my lifetime, the world's population has over doubled. And so we're starting to see the results of that. Uh, one of those is countries have become more uh, wealthy and have established a lot more educational systems to the point that in the last 20 years, the number of post uh, or of secondary education graduates has increased by two and a half. Like that is huge. And, and we're seeing that in this kind of tsunami of technology. Um, if you think about all of the scientists that were responsible for everything that, that has been taught in universities for decades, right? It is this, this list of, of scientists, many of whom are dead. Um, if you take all of those folks and add them up, they are only 10% of all the scientists that have ever, ever lived on the planet. The other 90% are alive today. That's how big this education shift is. That's how big the number of people that are working. And so we're starting to see things like patents worldwide skyrocket in this kind of uh, exponential growth. Same with PhDs. And if we look at technology, we see that in what I call building block technologies. These are complex 
is that the part of that complexity and room uh, are building blocks that just almost anyone can use to some degree. They're very inexpensive to learn. So 3D printing, CRISPR, cheap sensors, automation and robotics, uh, blockchain, open APIs, even quantum computing. Uh, these are, are technologies that you can get a, 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 an education on fairly easily. They apply to almost every industry, which is huge, uh, and it's fairly inexpensive to go buy. You can go buy a metal 3D uh, printer uh, that prints in metal for less than $10,000, which is just amazing. Same with a lot of these things. You get really inexpensive versions uh, and learn on them and produce products. So what's happening is not only do you have this huge number of people coming into the educated workforce, but these people are equipped with these building block technologies and working in every, every industry, they're combining these technologies with to solve problems in each of those industries. And as a result, you're getting lots and lots of new technological advancements. So if we were to plot these kind of along all of the, the domains, all of the different industries along the bottom, and then getting more complex as we go up, then, then the industry you work Work in is this very slim area, right? So we're in aerospace, so we're this very slim uh, slice of the pie. And if we were to look at machine learning efforts going on across the world, we have several, right? And we've actually had some very advanced stuff going on. However, if you were also to look more carefully at that, you would see that everyone has some AI and machine learning work going on. And in fact, some people are, are more advanced work. In fact, that, that one uh, to the right there, that's probably John Deere, right? Over in agriculture, they're actually one of the leaders in AI and machine learning. And yet, if I don't sit in those meetings about their technological advance and what they're doing, I probably would not see that as something we could use in space because I don't understand their jargon. I don't understand their problem space. And I don't really understand what that solution is doing. There are people that can actually look at that and kind of connect the dots. And for some of these solutions that are maturing in other industries, these solutions can be modified to actually help us in our industry, not everywhere, but in many. And in fact, this is what we're kind of seeing in the disruption of industry. Um, there's a pro that we're getting more technology than we've ever had to solve hard problems. And, and that's great because it gives us more tools to go innovate. The con is that because there's so much of them and that they're distributed across these different domains, that it is very hard to find them when you need them. If you think you can Google the latest and greatest technologies for your industry, then are how big because it just doesn't work. Like, this is this is showing itself in the technology world and in, in industry in that the rate of change of knowledge and technology is increasingly increasing really fast, so that it's really hard to find. The right skills and expertise and it's really hard to keep up and find these tech advances that can help us and the risk to organizations is that if we want to remain competitive and relevant we have to find these new technologies we have to leverage them to to increase uh, our productivity and to get to get better at what we're doing we are already seeing this disruption play out this this slide is actually a few years old in, in over a 15-year recent period over half of not companies, but our most successful companies went belly up. And you can kind of see that in the average lifespan of, again, the most successful companies went from almost 100 years, 100 years ago, and is down to actually, it's, I think the, the latest numbers are around 14 years. This is the average lifespan of a successful company. So there's something going on with the, the changes and how fast they disrupt. I'll just give you one example. Um, this is a uh, sub C7. They, they basically do oil and gas. And one of the things they do is they do inspections of pipeline bundles uh, from offshore oil rigs to shore. And they basically go out for um, a, about a week or two weeks uh, at a, in a ship that costs about a million dollars a day. Uh, and they go out and they lower a van sized piece of equipment and they run it next to that pipeline for two weeks. And at the end of that two weeks, they've, they've inspected the pipeline. And they went out to Nine Sigma and they said, okay, is there a better way to do this? Um, and, 
in after two weeks, they found an existing technology already being used in the mining industry, right? Not in a lab somewhere that still needed a bunch of development, but already being used that was handheld, not van sized, and could do that same job in two hours instead of two weeks. And this is the kind of disruption that, that when you find it, yes, it improves your performance. Yes, you can save a lot of money, but more importantly, if they had not found it in their, their uh, competitors had, they would no longer be in business, right? And so that's the kind of description we're talking about. So if we go back to our plot, if, if we're trying to innovate and innovation is so important for us to do, if this is your company, right? And you're, you're the slice and you've hired these people that are in this box because you have to have certain minimum requirements for, for their skills. Uh, and, but they're in that same domain of your, your uh, company and your industry, then if you're searching for these, these innovations that I represent with light bulbs uh, that are dispersed across industries, then if you put an individual on that, they're going to be able to access some of those innovations, but not nearly all of them. If you put a team, they'll do better. They can access and find more of those innovations, but it's still just a slice. However, if you put the crowd on this, this crowd, this open innovation idea, then statistically, you are actually much more likely of finding more of these solutions that can help you kind of avoid disruption and make the most. So that's that's kind of what we talk about a lot in our group is open innovation, as you guys are all aware, because you're you know attending an idea scale uh, webinar, right? Open meaning you're going beyond your local group. That could mean just locally within your own organization, which is a lot of what idea scale is used for, or even out to the public, right? To go and find the different ideas and skills needed to innovate uh, on the cutting edge. So these platforms, as you know, are, are pr about providing this kind of low friction matching at scale. You can think of them like Uber and Airbnb, right? Uber is finding you a ride uh, very quickly and efficiently uh, by tapping into people that have a ride and are willing to drive you somewhere, right? Same with Airbnb. And they're doing that at very low friction. You hit a couple of buttons, they show up and you go, right? very easy to use and it's very quick. Well, the same thing is happening with curated communities. These are companies like Topcoder and Tongle and Grabcat. So Topcoder is 1.6 million software developers and data scientists. Uh, filmmakers are at Tongle, mechanical engineers and designers at Grabcat, 11 million of them. Freelancers up to actually, I think this is a little old chart, 67 million people, which is very close to 1% of the world's population, all signed up on one platform. Um, and then you have uh, companies like Agorize and HeroX and Wazoku who all actually deal with general problem solving. And I would actually put IdeaScale in that category, right? Where you have communities of thousands and thousands of people who their passion is solving hard problems. And you have in these communities kind of a two-sided network. You have the crowd, which is really uh, drawn in around a passion, whether that's problem solving or coding or filmmaking, but they're they're coming to learn new skills, to connect with other people who have that passion, and hopefully maybe even find some opportunities, right? And on the flip side, the other side of that network, the companies are using those skills to actually solve other organizations' problems. So Top Coder will produce software for uh, a company or Tongle will make a commercial for some organization, right? And so it's a business model. And again, this is a, a learned group, but this is kind of how I talk this at NASA is if expertise is the thing that you care most about, right? And for some it is, right? I'm gonna argue a, a, a separate uh, argument here in a minute, but if skill is what you need, if expertise is what you need to solve your problem, then then the, the curve for the general population looks something like this, right? The peak of that is high school graduates, and then you got way out to the right, the, the world's experts, and kind of there in the middle of your college graduate and, and master's, right? And if you're like NASA, your organization doesn't even start talking to people unless their skill is in that that bachelor's or master's area, right? So that's where that start of that red curve is. And then we actually have some of the world's experts in certain domains, right? But what I caveat this with our organization and say, yes, this is absolutely the right way to think of it, except 
our organization is much, much smaller than that. In the scheme of 7.5 billion people, we are a teeny tiny drop, right? And so the, the value proposition is for us to tap into this long green wedge if expertise is what we care about. And in fact, a lot of these curated communities have some of these people actually more than you would think because if you think about it, who signs up on this to, to, to pro solve problems in their spare time or to do data science in their spare time? It's people who are passionate and good at something. And so we end up with actually more people than you would think in these communities uh, that we can then go access. Now, it's actually not about the skill. It's actually about this making connections. And in fact, MIT did a study where... They actually looked at all of the successes at in incentive, and what they found was 70% of the time, challenges were being solved by someone who was not in the same domain as the, the technical owner. So whatever that problem was, it was a chemistry problem, 70% of the time, it was someone in another industry that was maybe adjacent that was bringing them a solution. And 75% of the time, they already knew the solution. In other words, it existed. They were just adapting it into this, this, this uh, problem domain, right? So this kind of was the proof that showed us that this works. And I will tell you after over 750 of these projects that that happens all the time. It is a real phenomenon. So what we say is, look, diversity is really the key to innovation. It's diversity across industries. It's diversity across cultures, diversity across gender. And, and the more diversity you can get, the more chance you have at original thought that is bring, brought to bear and bringing in skills and expertise that you don't have in other ways. So just because the crowd can statistically access it, how do you find that right expert? How do you find that solution? And that is largely through an algorithm I call prizes. <laughs> um, these crowds have kind of perfected this method. It's not the only way, but the, uh, and, and AI is starting to provide some new capability here. But these curated crowds know how to, and the companies that the people they have in them know how to problem uh, formula, problem statement formulation. They know how to do that to get you a good problem statement. They know how to design the challenge. How much should you offer for a prize? What should you offer? Uh, how many prizes? How long should you run the challenge? They know how to execute the challenge. They have websites that are designed to intake uh, and protect solutions as they're put in, uh, keep them from uh, being stolen. Uh, they know how to filter the solution. That can act, in our contracts, we always put a clause that says, hey, whoever's hosting this, if we get 3,000 submissions, you're going to only provide to us the ones that meet our requirements so that we don't actually get stuck doing that. Uh, and then they actually know how to deal with protecting your, your competitiveness, protecting your intellectual property, licensing, getting the transfers uh, in licensing or uh, whatever you need for your IP at the end of the day. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples here. Um, this one uh, was with an incentive uh, several years ago, uh, and they had a, a large potato chip company that came and said, hey, look, we need a better way to remove grease from our potato chips. Um, they were shaking the trays of chips as they came out of the oil kind of mechanically, uh, and that would actually break some of the chips, uh, but it would shed the, the grease so they weren't too greasy, but it, it they needed a better way that had less loss uh, uh, and breakage, right? So I want to point out that most food engineers uh, and food production engineers and food scientists are actually mechanical engineers. Um, and you can kind of see that in this solution because mechanical en engineers are the experts on vibration. Um, but the first thing Incentive did was they changed this problem statement. So instead of remove, remove grease to potato chips, which largely would just appeal to food scientists and food production engineers, they changed it to how do you remove a viscous fluid from a delicate wafer? And this did two things. One, it kind of abstracted it so that their competitors did not know they were running a potato chip challenge, right? But more importantly, it opened up the challenge to almost anyone who had a, a knowledge of viscous fluids and delicate wafers, and that could really be a much broader set of people. And it turned out that the winning solution was to acoustically vibrate the air around those chips at a resonant frequency that kind of caused that oil to kind of vibrate and then effectively separate from the chip. Um, and, and it's interesting because this is a vibration solution. 
that all of those mechanical engineers remained blind to for 50 years, right? And it was a violinist who actually submitted that idea because she'd seen the rosin dance around on her stand, understood kind of what resonance can do and, and understood how that worked and so submitted, right? And I would argue she was a domain expert in vibration, just in a different domain, right? So another case study out of London Business School is the Roche Diagnostics. They came in with a bunch of challenges, but this, this particular one, they had been working for 15 years to get a very precise measurement for quantity and quality for this in vitro diagnostic machine. And they ran a challenge for 60 days. And at the end of that 60 days, not only did they get winning solutions, they actually got the same solution from two independent people because the solution existed in another industry and they simply identified it. But what kind of blew them away was when they looked across all of their submissions, everything that had been submitted in those 60 days had replicated everything they had done over 15 years of proprietary research. And, and, and you know, we talk about how innovation is about failure. Open innovation gives you the chance to actually get lots of failure in parallel, right? And that's important. Now, it's not as simple as that. You still have to evaluate yourself to measure, but you, you see this really in the, in the algorithm world where crowdsourcing is just amazing uh, to the point that Harvard was trying to figure out what was going on. So they ran an experiment where they got with National Institutes of Health and their mega blast algorithm which ran in just over four hours and had an accuracy of 0.72. And they did a control by bringing in data scientists that are really skilled. So they wanted to see was, was crowdsourcing just finding these people. So they, they found the people outside of crowdsourcing and basically gave them $120,000 in a year. And at the end of that, they had improved it significantly, an order of magnitude, right? Now it was 47 minutes. You could do maybe 10 runs per machine per dip a day. And they increased the accuracy, an incredible result. They then ran a two-week marathon match on Top Coder for a $6,000 prize. And at the end of that challenge, they had an algorithm that could run in 16 seconds, so three orders of magnitude faster, and increase the accuracy. And what I like to point out here, there's a logarithmic scale getting faster as you go right, uh, right to left and getting more accurate as you go up. The big red dot's the winner, but those 25 dots, smaller dots to the right, those are all the losers who had solutions two to three orders of magnitude better than the baseline one to two orders of magnitude better than the than the uh, the experts, right? So we see this and 89 different approaches were identified, which is additional uh, good that you can go do after the fact. So we see this over and over that crowdsourcing gets us lots and lots of good solutions that then kind of the best float to the top. So back to who we are. Our organization's uh, public-facing brain is called the NASA Tournament Lab, um, but we do work basically to solve problems for all the projects and programs at NASA, as well as any federal agencies that want our help. We have a way that they can access our contracts, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we basically put the processes together, we educate people, and then we'll walk people through this as opposed to just kind of throwing them over the fence to it. Um, we worked with people all around the world on this, um, both learning from them and contributing to them. Uh, we've been doing this for about uh, 10 years now, or actually I think closer to 12 years now. Uh, and, and we are actually known as one of the world's experts in this area, uh, but there's a lot of activity going on uh, around industry with this. Um, our toolkit is uh, really with these curated crowds. So one of those on the right is NASA at work. I'll talk more about that, but that's where we actually use idea scale currently to leverage our internal crowd. But then we actually have this noise two contract, this NASA Open Innovation Services two. That's that top portion where we actually have 32 different curated crowds that we can tap into. And if we add in the ones we can get to through purchase card or through our education uh, SBIR, we actually have 50 different crowds that we can access that represent over 200 million people. And that is the power that we have in this open innovation. So let's just talk through a few of those examples. Uh, I mentioned NASA at work. We're about to rebrand this to NASA Spark, but this is our internal crowd. We have brilliant people at NASA and we don't wanna just skip over them and go out to the crowd. We, we wanna see, have we already solved this problem? And so we have about half of our workforce uh, 
on this uh, community. So it's a volunteer uh, sign up. And we've done about two, and I think it's been closer to 250 challenges to date. Almost all of those are successful. And what they're really good at is enterprise knowledge sharing, basically finding out has someone else addressed this? Does someone else know something that we can actually capture inside? Uh, and we offer this, this free for all our projects to use. And as you can see there, they're largely successful when we run them. We usually run about uh, anywhere from two to four a month. Um, you can kind of get an idea here uh, of what the platform looks like. We, again, we use IdeaScale. Uh, and it's been uh, highly successful for us as, as we... Uh, move. One of the challenges we did early on, we had a scientist that needed a better way to improve our urine uh, measurements for urine volume in microgravity. When we deal with astronauts, we have all sorts of uh, body things we have to do. So sorry for the awkwardness here. But what's really interesting about this is we put this out on NASA work for our entire uh, employee community to, to see, does someone have a solution? And it turned out literally 300 yards away from the where the challenge owner lived uh, at work in his lab was another lab that had already developed a working prototype for another application. And by, by finding that and using that, they were able to skip a, a whole three to five years of development that was going to cost them over a million dollars. So real savings can come from this kind of work. Um, open innovation, uh, problem solving challenges, uh, our space poop challenge was one where we were trying to actually find a, a way to 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 uh, keep our astronauts healthy. Uh, if they go to the moon and develop a leak inside the Orion spacecraft, they can't return for six days and have to live in their spacesuit for six days. And that that can be a real health hazard. And so we ran this challenge to actually find ways to deal with uh, human waste again. Space stuff, you got to do all the things, right? We ended up with 5,000 submissions to that. It was run on HeroX and uh, ended up with some really interesting things. The winner of that was actually a, a flight surgeon from San Antonio who said, you know, in laparoscopic surgery, we pressurize the belly to about 15 PSI, which is actually even more pressure delta than we have in the suit. And they actually insert a little airlock that allows them to pass wipes and other things. And so there's was kind of a new way to think about that that had already been solved in the surgical area. Um, we do technology searches. This is where we're trying to find companies that have existing products. Uh, and we've done a whole series of these. We did one with the Lunar Surface, surface uh, Innovation Initiative where we're trying to deal with lunar dust, which is really caustic. It's very sharp. It can hurt you. It's kind of like asbestos in a lot of ways. Uh, and out of those searches, we found, you know, Hundreds of companies were identified, 25 of them we had never heard of, which when you have experts in lunar dust that have never heard of certain technologies and companies, that's a big deal, right? Because that's populating your trade space and getting you off to the right start. Uh, data science, I mentioned how much uh, good stuff we get out of that. Uh, one we did early on was the ISS Launchron Modeling and Power Optimization. Turns out if you get a shadow... Uh, kind of cast across this, you get a delta temperature that is really severe because in space, you can have 200 plus degrees on one side and negative 200 on the other. And in metals and materials that can have a warping. So they have to be really careful with the solar rays because they want to get the most power, but they can't have this shadowing happen. So we basically uh, used Top Coder. They uh, went to work on this really complex model. And we ended up with a fully functional model that actually performed better at the edge cases uh, and, and uh, was a bunch of different competitions we did. Really some nice, nice work there. Uh, that, that got us ahead. Uh, software challenges. A lot of people don't realize you can develop software. Uh, Top Coder actually knows how to, to basically chop up a problem into lots of little challenges, and they run one for each phase. And by doing that, they're tapping into that long green wedge within their 1.6 million, where they're finding the best experts within the subgroup, which is really interesting. We've done this with uh, our nutritionist app, where we actually found... Uh, a solution where we developed a, an iPad app that was used by the astronauts on the space station for many years. Uh, and it was the, the astronauts commented, hey, this 
this looks like a, a, a commercial app. It's not, you know, kind of our government issued stuff. This this really uh, was was well done. In fact, to the point that this app won, uh, I think it was one of the app, app of the years at Apple's developer conference. Um, and you kind of see here, they, they chopped it up into 21 different challenges and had over 50 people uh, that were working on it uh, throughout the life cycle of the development. Um, so I did, just want to pause here. This is this is kind of where we've gone with this. We've figured out how to do ideation, engineering models, software, algorithms, uh, prototypes, uh, technology catalysts, lots of different uses for crowdsourcing. And we've done a lot of it and tend to get really good cost savings and success out of it. Um, I want to pivot just a little bit because uh, in the last couple of minutes here, to talk about something we found when we were about halfway through this, which is that these crowds we were working with weren't just doing open innovation. Some of these crowds were actually doing freelance and gig work. And they were they were very similar, right? Because they were these curated crowds where people would join and they would kind of learn a process and interact. And it was kind of this matching that we were seeing. And what we noticed is there were some studies that came out uh, that I cite here um, that said, look, we're going through a change where these crowd platforms are, are now providing that same matching at scale, but they're doing it with people and talent. Um, so you were seeing companies like Top Talent, Freelancer, and Upwork, and Maven all come out. And the studies were showing that people were moving into this freelance world at about three times the rate of normal full-time employees to the point that by 2019, the average organization's total workforce was over 40% non-full-time labor, which had doubled over the past seven years. And when they looked at the trends, by 2027, they were seeing more freelance labor than full-time labor. And then COVID happened and it just accelerated everything to the point that between 20 and 21, there was 34% growth in the independent workforce. And, and we thought, you know, this is going to matter. Um, and so we started looking at some of the studies um, because expertise also affects and access to talent affects how well you're able to innovate. And one of the studies was really kind of shocking. Um, you know, you think people really love the, the full-time work, but what we found is the people that had gone to full-time freelance, over half of them answered the question, how much money would it take you to come back and work full-time for an organization? 50% said there is no amount of money that I will take to go back. And so we're seeing this really different shift of autonomy. And part of it is about lifelong learning. The pace of change is such that within an organization, people have a hard time keeping up with the latest and greatest skills because that's not the focus of companies, right? Whereas in the freelance world, we're seeing that more freelancers upskill just naturally than within uh, full-time employment. And that's a really important thing that the World Economic Forum came out with a study that said, hey, Oh, after coming out of, and sorry, something happened with my slide here, but after COVID, 83% of companies were scaling remote work, 84% were accelerating their digitalization, and 50% were accelerating automation to the point that by 2025, there would be this huge set of jobs that were going to be automated uh, and no longer human jobs. Uh, 85 million jobs going away with 97 million created. Right. And that's we're in the middle of that 20 to 25 that this study was covering. And I think now that we're seeing chat GPT and other technologies work, more people are seriously looking at this problem. And the problem, if you look at it, isn't jobs. The problem is upskilling. The problem is getting people from those jobs that are no longer needed to the jobs that are needed. And so we have this really interesting problem right now where we actually have people being laid off and jobless, whereas in other industries, we have severe shortages of people. And what, what that study from World Economic Forum said was over 50% of people will need reskilling by 2025, and 40% of their skills have to change. And the, uh, you have to know, the average company's budget for any sort of training is $1,000 per employee per year. And the kind of training they're talking about needing 
is one to five months worth of training, which is not nearly covered by a thousand dollars, right? Which is mostly used for compliance and safety, by the way. Um, so there is this new workforce that is freelance that's coming out that's starting to address some of this that is one on demand and persistent. People are forming persistent teams of freelancers that work just like their their co-workers and they can go back to over and over and they're not just a flash in the plan or for some tasks, it maybe is a flash in the plan like a, an Uber driver would be, right? It's available both globally and locally, right? Think about uh, Uber, right? It is 5 million uh, people in that network that are global and yet someone will come pick you up at your doorstep. And, and that is the case all the way. There are now services, crowds uh, of freelancers where you can get oil field workers this way or IT workers, really interesting. And they will show up. Um, it is the full spectrum of workers, all the way from grunt, all the way to experts. Um, in fact, we've, we've hired, uh, I'll show in a minute, uh, wicked problems expert this way. This idea of lifelong learning, this new model, you what you can almost say with certainty is in your organization, you will almost never be able to find all of the latest and greatest skills because it's too hard to on-ramp them all and which ones do you even need, you don't know, right? Whereas in the crowd, you can almost always find, in fact, in my experience, you can always find the latest and greatest skills. So it's a really interesting kind of flip that we've done here. Uh, and then work platforms are providing lower and lower friction uh, for that access. So ways to provision people on quickly, ways to actually find uh, the right expert very quickly. Um, we've actually changed our contracts over the last couple of years to where we now have several of these kind of open, what we call open talent uh, platforms where there are experts that we can get. And again, Diversity is this key, being able to get people from all over uh, and to the point that we now have this ability to reach back into these communities for our experts. We've done that uh, in several projects, including private, uh, data privacy expert, uh, wicked problems. And this is just a, a few of these kind of case studies. So this is my get off the stage chart, which is open really is the future. And innovation isn't this kind of optional thing that organizations can take or leave. If you're not innovating, you're not going to be around for much longer. And so getting that culture of innovation, providing the tools, getting people uh, really trained on how to use this, because innovation is one of the hardest things for an organization to take, take on. Uh, and this open innovation is wonderful and it's a great tool, but it does not come free and cheap. You have to learn to use it and use it effectively. I will tell you the biggest thing that I warn organizations is if you take on these tools and don't learn about them first, you can actually wreck innovation in your organization. So it is something that is very effective, but you have to know what you're doing and you have to, to sign up to doing it well. So with that, I will stop. And we have, I think, about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, my last chart just here is we are serious about this because we have hard problems to go to. Go do. So we're going to head that last thing. With that, I'll stop sharing and we can go into Q&A mode. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. That was awesome. Let's jump into Q&A. So I will let everyone know at the bottom of the Zoom webinar, you'll see a Q&A box. You can submit your questions there, um, and then I will field them to Steve to push live. Um, all right, we actually already have one. So, yeah. Steve, what best practices do you recommend for building a really engaged internal crowdsourcing community at a government agency? Sure. It's a really great question. And I would say government agency, regular company, they all work the same uh, remarkably. Um, I would say a, a couple of things. One, have a Problem, have a real problem that you're trying to address. Don't try to do something where you do a, a suggestion box, where you say, just give us all your innovative ideas. That's actually where you can get the train wreck um, because how are you going to evaluate these? Those And, and your, your crowd, what you have to really realize is your employees want to innovate. Um, large organizations have been really bad about being open to innovation. And so you have to realize innovation is really about personal vulnerability. So if someone's going to give you their best ideas, they want to feel safe. 
They don't want it to be shut down or mocked or whatever. And their crazy ideas, which really is where the innovation really lies, has to be safe for that. And so most organizations are operational or they're trying to get things done. And that culture is hostile to innovation. That culture is, we don't have time for that. We don't have time for change. We don't have time for something new, those crazy ideas, and they shut them down. In meetings, if you think about it, every time somebody raises their hand, especially if they're new and has some crazy idea, they get shut down. And it only takes about two or three of those times for that person to then think, this is not a safe space. I can't do this. So when you're on your platform and you do ask pointed questions, I really can't emphasize that much. You have to have the owner of the problem who actually will be able to implement the solution has to be on board. They have to be uh, bought in because if they're not and the crowd comes up with an idea, then when you go to try to get it implemented, those stakeholders are kind of come out of board work say you don't you didn't understand the problem and they won't accept it even if it's a good solution so it's, so it's you got to get that buy-in you got to have that problem owner you have to have a specific problem with good criteria for how you're gonna what you need and then you have to be supportive as those people those ideas come in that owner should be engaged with those people and say oh tell me more about your idea if they instantly say well this won't work because or you know and you can say that different ways. You can say, this is really interesting. Tell me how it addresses this particular part of the problem. Then you're kind of drawing them out and say, okay, they haven't dismissed me. And we actually had a study done on our NASA at work platform a few years ago where uh, Harvard came back, uh, maybe it was NYU. They came back and they said, when the conversation became kind of casual, when the people started having some trust, and they could kid around and have a back and forth, that's when the good idea came. So what they found was people would give you their tenuative, their, their kind of safe idea. And depending on how you reacted would determine if you got their real idea because people are guarded, right? So I would say that's one thing. Um, view this, if you have the if you have the platform, you need to be curating your crowd. If they just see this as a website where people occasionally put things on and nobody really cared, like you're going to get what you pay for there. You're going to get the occasional kind of thing. But if you think of it as curation, where this is where people come to learn about innovation, where they come to engage, you hold webinars on every challenge you do, or you have regular engagement, or you spin off and have some of your some of your team members will host uh, maybe a local events, you know, a lunchtime talk on a problem or something, that's when they start to feel like community, right? Uh, and I think you really want to promote that as much as you can. We have uh, webinars with almost every challenge we do now, and they typically have anywhere from 300 to 700 people. Um, and it is Q&A and the rest of it. And it's, it's really great. Um, the, the first book I read on, on crowdsourcing was Jeff Howe's book called Crowdsourcing, and he was the Wired editor who, who kind of coined the term crowdsourcing since back in, I think, 2010. Uh, and one of the things he said, it's always stuck with me, which is a crowd only has about 5 to 10% of true believers that are on the site regularly and, and you can count on, right? But the rest of the crowd has con contribution. You just have to extract it out, and there's kind of a 1% that's somewhere in there that you're trying to get that's really high value. And the best crowds curate that 10%, that 5 to 10% to help them find that 1% in the rest of the 80% or 90%. So it's this really kind of interesting model that's out there. But find a re if you can, find a reason that they will show up on your site every single day for five minutes. You know, so posting new content, posting new ideas having discussions, uh, and that takes work, right? Uh, you also don't want to become the spam generator, right? You don't want to be the thing that they're getting emails from every single day. Uh, be respectful. We we talk about our crowd such that we say, look, if you only read the email and we recognize you're busy, you may not even get to the email, but on that email, we're going to list above the fold, right? So you don't have to scroll in or anything, just what our top challenges are. That, that, and, and if you read those, and you can read those in 10 seconds, you'll know whether you have anything to contribute. 
or in, interest in that. And you can delete that email as soon as you decide you don't. But in that every 10th email, if you see, oh, I, I, I'm i interested in this, or I have some, I've done some work in this, then you dig deeper. And then people will actually say, oh, have you talked to George? Or have you talked to Jane? They're doing this work. Or I did this work. Have you seen it? And that's where, and, and that's where the ideas start to, to roll in. Um, and we we think that's great because that's a self-filtering. We don't have to go through 150 ideas to pick out what's the best one because they're all really good. They're all coming from people that know what they're talking about. So uh, so those are some best practices. I kind of went on and on there. Sorry about that. No, those are great. I think it's very, very relatable, especially when you talk about like needing to feel like you're in a safe space to share your input. And that's when the best ideas come out. So that was great. Uh, I will answer or push another one to you. Um, someone is wondering what determines whether you want to source from an internal or external crowd? Yeah, if we have time, we will almost always go to the internal crowd first because why would you go spend money if you already have the answer, right? And we want to know what we already have as well because especially when you're kind of licensing or paying for, for technology rights, if you already have rights, you'd certainly want to know that beforehand. So um, that, that there's, if you can and have time, go to your internal crowd. Uh, typically, it's only a three to four week kind of a cost, so it's not too bad. Um, and we try to do that. Um, we will stop there if we get a good enough answer. Um, and a lot of time, it is money that drives internal and external because external crowds do cost uh, quite a bit more money. So that's that's probably the easiest answer for that. That's fair. Thank you. And what lessons have you learned from your experience with over 100 different challenges? And how have they influenced your approach to future crowdsourcing initiatives? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've personally done over 100. Our group's done 750. Um, so we, um, we've learned so many things. We learned a lot of legal things, uh, just in terms of who should participate, who can't participate, why, uh, how you can pay money, what kind of prizes. I would think, you know, um, if you're not familiar with the four Gs, uh, the incentives for crowdsourcing, gold, guts, glory, and good, I recommend you invest in understanding that because people that think that crowdsourcing is only about cash prizes do not understand those dynamics. Most of your people uh, are doing it because they love hard problems or they want to get a reputation and, and a boost. Uh, it's really interesting. And a lot of the altruism, uh, people participate on NASA challenges driven by, I want to be part of that mission. Uh, and for 50 years, we've been like, look, look at the cool things we're doing. Don't you wish you were us? And now in crowdsourcing, we can say, no, you can be part of what we're doing. And that's a that's a big deal to people. And, and when you're working hard things like climate uh, and, and uh, you know, any sort of social issues, people are, are they'll work for free. It's amazing. Um, I would say other things we've learned is just the power, uh, the people that win our challenges in almost every case, we never would have been able to hire them. Like they just, they're not who you would think they are. Uh, one was a freshman at Berkeley who won like a hundred thousand dollars on a data science challenge while he was learning data science. He hadn't even, he was, he was taking it to figure it out. Right. And yet he brought a new skill uh, with his understanding of Blender that actually brought a whole bunch of stuff together. Um, so there's just a ton uh, out there in terms of uh, that the, the crowd has so much more to offer than you can imagine. Uh, and you need to know what you're doing when you reach out to them. Uh, you have a responsibility to communicate with them well, to to keep the, the positive attitude, to follow through on any sort of pledges. Um, so yeah, that's that. Those are I could probably go on and on for thirty minutes on that. <laughs> that's great, thank you. Um, what do you think the statistics you shared on the future of work mean for government agencies? Um, what should people listening take take as a top takeaway with this information? Um, the thing I try to impress on people the most is that we are in a new regime of change. And that new regime of rapid change 
is breaking organizations. They cannot recruit and retain talent fast enough. They can't keep up with the, the technologies and the expertise needed. And it turns out that, that crowdsourcing uh, in its breadth, right, is kind of the right tool at the right time. Uh, and so it's not like this optional feel good tool that's going to, you know, a lot of people look at it as this PR tool, like, oh, yes, we're engaging our customers. Well, yeah, you can use it for that. But if you're serious about finding the latest and greatest tech and leveraging that and finding the greatest, uh, the best experts, crowdsourcing is a significant tool that that I think it has to be on your list of tools or you're missing out. And right now, disruption is real. Like companies are just, they're, they're, they're fed. So if you want to be around in five years and you're a company, you better be looking at these tools because they are, they're one of the few ways that you can address the rapid change problem. Absolutely. And we have a few variations of this same question. Um, but if you don't have any formal process for approval of getting these things started, how would you go about starting an innovation crowdsourcing program? I usually would say start with an internal program because uh, your management will feel more safe with that, uh, and and you can you can buy a a, a, a you know plat or or pay for a platform like IdeaScale, and there's also you know Wizoku and others. Um, I would say the the thing you want to do is invest in training a skilled set of folks. And if you can have that team include not just kind of administrative folks, but but people who uh, have been around a while, have been on the technical side, because you're broke, you're a broker, right? You're basically trying to set up a challenge for the platform. So you've got to be able to talk their language. And if you have scientists and engineers and tech folks, if you don't understand their problem, it's really hard to get it into the right shape. So having at least some technical folks in there that can help you, it also establishes trust. Like scientists and engineers don't like to hand, you know, HR folks their problem to solve. It just doesn't feel right, right? So there's that. Uh, there's a trust you've got to build up. You've got to get really good at that. Um so I would say just get really good training on that and then follow those rules about being specific, solve specific problems with specific stakeholders. As soon as, as somebody goes, an upper man, and it's going to be an upper management, hey, we should have a challenge on climate. The, your response shouldn't be, great, we're right on it. Your response should be, who owns that? Who's going to implement whatever we come up with and who understands the problem here? Because if you don't have those people, that challenge will get frustrating for everyone because the 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 people working on it will give their heart into it but you won't have a way to evaluate what they got because you don't have the right expertise when you do and it all falls apart and they don't implement it they're going to be mad because they gave you good ideas and you just wasted them it dilbert cartoons are real in that they are how people see uh, management and large organizations when it comes to this. And it's called innovation theater. And you want to avoid that because it will basically send a message to your workforce that we are just talk. We aren't serious about this. And if you're going to go down that path, don't do it because uh, innovation theater will kill innovation in your company or your organization. Very fair. Um how is crowdsourcing changing with AI or do you see it changing with AI? Definitely. Um, I think there's two things. The near term, we think we're going to get better, better solutions because people are learning to use this. So they're, they're using it for research and get ideas. So, I mean, it's a tool, right? And they're using that to, to, to kind of formulate more informed and better responses and format their responses better and clear, more clearly. Um, in the long term, I think that we're going to latch into a new kind of level of human human problem solving capability through AI. Um, I think that the next I call it Crowd 2.0, but we're all that we already see crowds using AI to match problems, uh, either tasks or, or people. What we think is the next level is when you can actually go through a you know if you have a crowd of five hundred thousand people. 
if you know kind of what their personality type is for working and you know what their specific skills are, not just to what they put on a resume, but their digital exhaust of specifically what they know and have done, then you can start to assemble really very rapidly using AI small teams of five or seven people who are matched skill-wise to a problem, also considering diversity and making sure that's seated. And you can have things like half of the team should have worked together before and know each other. And there it's facilitated by somebody who knows how the problem solving and they've all been trained on, you know, six hats and scamper and all these innovation methodologies. So they're already equipped. Well, now you have a machine, right? Where AI can kind of put some of those and you could you know, overnight make 50 of those teams, right? Uh, it's AI can do things really, really quickly. And once people work on high performing teams that are doing things, you know, in hours that used to take months, they're going to love that and be drawn to that. But it's also going to create kind of the ability to solve really hard problems very rapidly. Today, crowdsourcing is, uh, challenges are limited because it's largely individuals. So unless you're going to spend large dollars like an X prize or a DARPA self-driving car challenge where you've got a $10 million prize, you're not going to get a, a big group of, of people out of academia and industry together, right? That's how those work. And they're great challenges, but they're expensive. And so our challenges right now have to be broken down in kind of simple-ish problems that someone with one or two domain knowledge uh, kind of scope can do. We do still see teaming, but it's it. I think in this next level in 2.0, it's going to be significant and it's going to be pivotal on AI. Absolutely. We have a, a lot of AI integration here at Ideascale. We're like trying out, integrating. So definitely agree with you there. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's do, is there an ideal time frame um, for ramping up internal crowdsourcing campaigns, whether that's start to finish date or just lengthwise? Um, usually we, we do about four to six weeks on keeping them open, but uh, honestly, we can, you can do them. You can actually set them up as sprints two weeks. It's you kind of setting, what you always find is you get a lot of traffic day one and a lot of traffic on the last day. And in between, you know, you get some after the webinar and things like that, but you know, uh, kind of depends on what you want to establish as pace. You can very much have a, you know, quick two-week pace if you have a good pipeline. Um, remember, you want to keep the crowd engaged. One of the reasons we only try to have about three or four at any one time is we don't want them to have to read through a list of 35 challenges on the email to find what they're doing. So there's, there's kind of psychology, if you will, that you want to have around what's, what's digestible. Uh, you could always have more, you could always have more things. I've seen, I've seen people gamify with A, A, B testing and other things on their sites where you're actually evaluating and improving designs. Uh, if anyone's ever familiar with Quirky, uh, which was an invention site, I think they're still out there, but they used to be really great. You would get these little, you know, point rewards for everything that you were improving somebody else's idea or naming it and all these kind of things. Uh, that kind of interaction typically is nice too. It kind of went off on tangent there, sorry. No, that was great, thank you. Uh, I will wrap things up now, Steve. We're getting a lot of positive feedback in the Q&A. Everyone's very appreciative for what you shared today. A lot of great insights gained and everyone, I see like an Emma in Scotland, like there's people from all over joining. So thank you so much. Um, and if anyone is interested in an innovation assessment for their organization, I am going to send my email right now in the chat. And you can just feel free to email me at elizabeth.fontaine at ideascale.com and I will set you up with an innovation strategist. But thank you everyone so much for joining. Thank you, Steve, and um, have a great day. Thanks, Hal. Bye.